Good afternoon. I'm going to find out if I'm mic'd or not, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. But um, welcome to the Public, to, uh, public Interest Declassifications Board, Board's first public meeting in, uh, since the beginning of COVID. So we have had, uh, we have had meetings, um, but they've all been virtual today uh, since the pandemic started. So we're very excited to be here in person today. Um, so I'm Alyssa Starzak. I'm the acting chair of the Public Interest Declassification Board. Um, and again, we're very uh, enthusiastic about having an audience today. Um, so we're going to have a couple of attendees join us today. Um, so, but, um, but before we get to that, um, I just want to say many thanks to Mark Lawrence and the Lyndon B. Johnson uh, Presidential Library for hosting us, and of course to the Clement Center for organizing the conference. Um, so I'm going to start um, just an overview of what we're going to cover in the meeting, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Carter Burwell um, to give us uh, a sense of what to expect later this evening. And then I'll give I'll turn it then I think Carter will turn it over to Ezra Cohen right here, um, who will give a sense of what the PIDB has done over the course of the past year. Um, the board is also going to be joined by Evan Gottesman, um, who's uh, currently a staffer on the Senate, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, who's going to give a sense of some of the challenges that we see with classification and declassification policy, and really where what Congress is thinking right now and where we might go in the next year. Um, and I think after that, and let's let's keep track, make sure I have it all in my notes here. Um, I think we're going to do uh, we're going to do I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're going over the next year um, and what we see in the year ahead um, from a from a just from a big big initiative standpoint. Um, if you have questions, um, we're gonna, we wanna make sure we have time to take questions, um, but there's also a, an email that you can send questions to, and that is PIDB at NARA.gov, so N-A-R-A.gov. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to email. We'll also open up the mics at some point and make sure we take questions that way. So looking forward to a productive meeting today. Again, thanks for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Carter. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I am, uh, one of the the newest member, I think, of the Public Interest Declassification Board, and and I like to say that this conference was really um, a, a gleam in the eye of of John Powers, who was the um, at the time one of the lead staffers, and welcomed me, called to let me know that Senator McConnell had appointed me to the board, and gave me a kind of a welcome and introduction to the board, um, and told me. Um, it was such a, uh, the issue of declassification had very, there was very little public interest on the subject of declassification, that it was a sleepy subject, that, um, that, 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 rec that it was the goal of the public interest declassification board to help raise the awareness about issues about classified information, the struggles with declassified information, and that it was the, the, the mission of the, of the PIDB to help do that. And one of the ways to do that was to try and have a conference and try and get out of Washington and come to you know, a place that regularly dealt with the subject. Um, and that, um, that, that having a, a public conference on the subject would help raise awareness and make the public interested in declassification. So that was ironic because that was about nine months ago. Um, you know, very grateful to Will and Bowden um, here at the Clement Center and Adam Klein at the Strauss Center uh, for helping to put this on. And Elizabeth, who is floating around in the back, um, incredibly helpful to, to try and pr put this event together with the idea to raise the awareness in it among. That's actually. Yeah, that's actually an Amber Alert that's coming through. So everybody's phones are probably lighting up. Um, so you know, to raise to raise the profile of the subject and to do so with the constituencies who care about the subject. So of course, you know, tonight um, Avril Haines is coming, the director of national intelligence. She'd spoken on the issue recently, and and kind of uh, when I joined the board, this is an issue that the the PIDB has been focused on for a long time. And so incredibly grateful that she's coming tonight. And um, I think C-SPAN's covering it, that she's gonna speak on issues. There they all go. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, is gonna speak on the subject and really grateful to hear what she's gonna have to say. Um, you know, we know that there is ongoing activity and then, you know, it's publicly reported that the National Security Council is considering changing the executive order related to 
uh, classified information. Um, looking forward to hearing if maybe that's uh, there's progress there. Um, but tomorrow's conference is incredibly important as well, because the hope is to hear from various constituencies that care about classified information. Um, so we're going to have um, uh, historians, you know, academics who 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 regularly want to engage with classified information, but have uh, struggled to do so because they're not able to. Um, we have a panel of technologists who are coming, and um, as as the as information is digitized as emails that the, the scope and breadth of classified information is expanding exponentially you know somebody i think there was an op-ed we're drowning in secrets and um is technology a way forward for that can you use artificial intelligence can you screen so that we can start sharing this information um we have a panel of 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 uh media you know, um, who we had an event back in Washington recently, and they talked about how they are the representatives of public interest, that they need to, you know, be a part of the conversation. And I think it's incredibly important. So we're grateful um, to uh, to have a few people. Ben's going to lead, lead the panel tomorrow with uh, several representatives from the media to talk about what their struggle with classified information. That'll be very entertaining. And then I think I'm going to lead a panel um, with with government historians. Um, and um, uh, how they regularly kind of deal with it, how they prioritize classified information. Does that help give us a path forward? Um, you know, grateful that in the middle of all of this, my former boss, Senator Cornyn, is going to come and give an address too and talk about how critically important transparency is. And I think as his speech is saying, you know, uh, folks are, are are focused in Washington about the reauthorization of 702 and one of our critical national security tools and whether transparency is a path to that and that we need to that that the public needs greater confidence in what our national security folks are doing in the in the way that we're handling and treating with treating national security information and is transparency a path forward so um all of that is uh, a long-winded way of saying we're grateful that you're interested in classified information now. We're grateful that you're going to hear from civil society groups and academics and uh, journalists and, and technology wonks and the director of national intelligence and Senator Cornyn. So thanks again to the Clement Center for having us, um, for the LGB, LG, LBJ Library for hosting us. And... Um, you know, I will now turn it over with that long-winded introduction to Ezra Cohen, who is just finished leading us as chair of the PIDB, you know, and, um, and incredibly successful in pushing a number of objectives over the finish line and continuing to do so. So grateful for your leadership, and um, I'll pass it over to you, Ezra. Well, thanks, Carter. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Um, we're going to be uh, doing a lot uh, over the next 24 hours uh, on this subject. And, you know, as uh, Carter said, when we uh, came up with the idea for this conference um, about nine, 10 months ago, we were a bit worried we would be talking to ourselves as we often are uh, in this field. But I think uh, things have changed a bit. Um, the board's also done a lot over the past year. Um, and, you know, we've been uh, really uh, lucky that we have. Uh, for the first time in many years, the board has a full uh, complement of members. Um, and uh, that's not something we've always had, but that's also allowed us to really uh, bring in a lot more viewpoints and also tackle uh, many, many more uh, subjects. Um, we started off the year uh, last January by sending a, a report uh, to uh, Speaker Pelosi, then Speaker Pelosi uh, and the President of the United States. And uh, we highlighted to them, I think one of the main things from that uh, memo was the fact that this mission of making sure, looking after our classified records, uh, not just so that we can safeguard them, but also so that we can get out what we need for the American public uh, for, for a pro proper degree of transparency uh, is underfunded. Uh, and we were, we were and under-resourced uh, and, and we were extremely uh, clear about that. Uh, after that, uh, we uh, 
got to work very quickly with uh, tasking from Congress uh, that was in the National Defense Authorization Act uh, to review uh, the Marshall Islands classified records related to nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Um, and uh, that that was a it was a challenge for the board, given limited resourcing on this topic in general, but also the fact that uh, the, the number of records related to nuclear weapons testing that for the Marshall Island, in the Marshall Islands that are still classified to this day uh, is staggering. Um, and uh, performing that review across the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense. Uh, and uh, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Th there was an enormous uh, amount of work that the staff had to do, uh, really, um, you know, uh, kind of moonlighting uh, doing that because the same staff that handles these key requests to declassify things at the National Archives, the same staff that handles uh, uh, making sure that agencies are properly handling classified records is the staff that we have to do that type of study. So it was extremely uh, uh, onerous. Um, ultimately, what we found is um, it, it really is a great representation of the problem. Um, here's this issue, huge public interest. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are many Marshallese who, uh, uh, you know, continue to have health effects. Um, and uh, but there are all these records that remain classified. And uh, the, the kind of not knowing uh, creates a lot of questions. Um, after that, uh, the board um, really turns its focus back to making sure uh, that uh, the 9-11 records uh, and some key 9-11 records uh, were released to the public. Uh, this is something that the board started uh, very early on, uh, two years ago. Um, we, uh, we were specifically interested uh, in getting some of these records out now that we're 20 years past the attack uh, on 9-11. And ultimately, uh, we've so far had one record released. There's another record in the pipeline, but it was the transcript uh, that the 9-11 or the memo uh, that the 9-11 commission wrote related to uh, from their interview with George Bush, President Bush and uh, Vice President Cheney. And I think there were a lot of very insightful things in there about the way the vice president and the president communicated about uh, some really uh, some of the most uh, important authorities that they have. Um, from there, uh, the board uh, finally was able to respond uh, uh, to a request that we got from Senator Murphy, uh, which came in just before the pandemic. Uh, and you know, obviously, we were delayed in getting that out because it was very hard for us to meet. Um, and uh, there were uh, several recommendations that we made to the president uh, regarding the records that Senator Murphy had uh, had requested uh, one of the documents related to uh, a national was a national intelligence estimate uh, about the election uh, election interference foreign election interference and the other was a document related to uh, the, uh, the 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 death of and assassination of Jamal Khashoggi um, and I think just to kind of wrap things up um, you know the the other big accomplishment from last year uh, was um, the release of uh, a good portion of the remaining records that are still classified that are related to the John F. Kennedy assassination. Um, you know, this is something the board has, has fought for for a long time. We talked to a lot of people. We really tried to understand the topic. We, we wrote to the president on multiple occasions, uh, interacted with people at the NSC, uh, um, and um, we brought uh, quite a bit of public attention to this. And, um, you know, we were very, very pleased uh, with uh, President Biden's uh, decision to release really almost 75% of those records. And we, and we hope that the remaining records will be released soon. Um, you know, that was a real case study in, um, uh, I think, what's wrong with the system, that after so many years, uh, all that information, which, which has been uh, uh, withheld, um, many of it just because we simply didn't have the resources to look at it. Uh, you know, just just think of all the uh, questions that have been created because we couldn't have more transparency. Um, and so that was, a, a, it's been a busy year. It was a busy year. And uh, I, all I'll say in closing, uh, before I turn, uh, turn it to uh, Michael to uh, introduce the speaker, um, is that... Uh, you know, uh, we really, uh, the board is, is nonpartisan. 
uh, and, 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 and you know, what do we mean by that? Well, we're all appointed by different people, but this is really a topic where there is an enormous uh, agreement. Uh, the board is, works in, in an incredibly effective way. Um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't be passing the torch to a better person. Uh, and so we're very, very happy uh, and uh, couldn't be happier to have Alyssa now as, as the acting chair. So thank you, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Can we turn it over to Michael? Yep. Sure, thanks, Ezra. Um, let me just first um, amplify what's been said already about Ezra and his leadership, because if it was not for Ezra's leadership and member uh, Carter's involvement, we would not be here today and certainly not have the conference tomorrow. So thank you both uh, for your hard work on getting this set up for us. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Evan Katzman, who works for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence since 2005. And in 2009, he was um, appointed to be the counsel on the committee. And that makes him the longest serving professional staff member on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is quite a task, given that they've had numerous chairman and vice chairman throughout all those years. And it certainly talks to the professionalism that Evan brings to the table about himself. Um, he also has a reputation since it is Washington. Everybody has a reputation. And his is one of being a very hardworking individual, an individual who does his homework, knows the issue, and also asks very tough questions. And I know that firsthand because I briefed the chairman, the vice chairman, and Evan on numerous occasions when I worked at the Department of Defense. So he comes by that reputation earnestly. So thank you for coming and joining us today and welcome to our first meeting. Thank you. Um, am I on? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's a real honor and a pleasure uh, to be with the board. Um, I'm not actually the counsel on the committee. I think at one point they just allowed me to call myself counsel just because I once had a law degree, uh, but it doesn't go um, beyond that. Um, uh, I, a lot of what I want to say today is an appreciation for the board and the work that it's done and to explain exactly how, especially in recent years, it has informed the Senate Intelligence Committee. It's informed my boss on the committee, who's Senator Wyden from Oregon, uh, also um, Senator Moran from um, Kansas, uh, and the committee as a whole. Uh, it is a model of how an outside independent entity can do research, can uncover problems in the federal government, and then those problems then can be acted upon. Uh, by people in Congress. Um, the appreciation that the Intelligence Committee in Congress has uh, as a whole for the PIDB is reflected, one, in the fact that a few years ago uh, we voted to permanently uh, authorize the PIDB. Previously, it had to be reauthorized on a periodic basis, and that's not fun for anybody, um, but it's an indication of how uh, important uh, the, the board is. And then also um, the fact that a member of the committee will be speaking here tomorrow, and uh, no fewer than three uh, staff members uh, are here today and tomorrow um, as well. So there's a real affinity uh, and appreciation. Um, I don't want to go too far back because the question of Congress and overclassification and declassification problems goes back decades and decades and decades. Um, my boss, Senator Wyden, worked with Daniel Patrick Moynihan on this issue a couple of decades ago. I'm not going to go further back. But um, what has happened uh, recently is that there have been a series of very good reporting, very important uh, investigation by the PIDB, and also I should say the ISU which has also really contributed to uh, the country's understanding and Congress's understanding uh, of the problem um, as well. So for years, uh, the PIDB and the ISU were putting out reports about this wave of tsunami of classified information, right? In their digital world, um, uh, information gets classified, you know, at, at a click of a button, right? And there's, there's, there are no barriers to just piling it on and piling it on and piling it on. Uh, but meanwhile, on the back end, the declassification process is completely obsolete. Um, 
the board has reported on this. Um, most of you probably know this already, otherwise you wouldn't be at a public interest declassification board meeting. Um, but it was a problem that started to really get the attention of a number of members of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, and then in um, uh, the board actually had a one very specific uh, uh, recommendation, a lot of recommendations, but one in particular caught the attention of a number of members of Congress, including uh, Senator Wyden, which was to designate the Director of National Intelligence as the executive agent for declassification. And the purpose was that only that office had the ability, the bureaucratic strength, the expertise to push forward um, investments in the kind of modernization technology that really needs to happen if the declassification process is going to keep up with the tsunami of classification uh, of classified information um, to find best practices across the agencies to promote and also to promote uh, integration among the agencies uh, and a federated system that would allow everybody to work together to make sure that information that needs to get declassified does get declassified. So in 2020, Senators Wyden and Moran introduced bipartisan legislation that would have codified the PIDB um, recommendation. Uh, and then in September of 2020, uh, we had an open hearing about it. And I overheard some people saying, you know, how often does this happen that the Senate Intelligence Committee has a um, uh, open hearing about anything really, but particularly about declassification? And the answer is not that frequently. So it was a watershed moment in terms of creating this public record um, on this subject. Um, one of our witnesses was John Tierney, who is a member of the board. Uh, and then the ODNI was there. And there was discussion about this question about the DNI being designated the executive agent for declassification. There wasn't complete agreement about it. But what was really important was the consensus that came out of this open hearing. And the consensus was that there is a serious problem. Uh, everybody recognized it. The director of national intelligence folks, they recognized that there was no disagreement, nor was there any disagreement about the need for serious reform and investments in modernization and the need to create uh, integration among the agencies. Um, so we had the open hearing, there are questions for the record that were answered both by Mr. Tierney and by the ODNI, those are public records. And so um, while uh, the PIDB and the ISU um, provided all the information that we needed to really get the ball rolling, and for that we were extremely indebted, um, we, the, the committee um, was able to have this open hearing uh, in which it laid out uh, on the congressional record. Um, so that was September 2020. In um, uh, November, there was an election and a new administration came in and uh, we picked up where we left off. Um, uh, Director Haynes, during her confirmation process, uh, was asked um, about the problem, and she acknowledged that, no, the, uh, the declassification process cannot keep pace with the uh, rapid uh, amount of classifications that were happening. She also said that the DNI plays a role in promoting strategic investments in modernization uh, to address that issue. So right from the get-go, during her confirmation process, the DNI um, was acknowledging the issue, acknowledging the need for uh, reform. Um, it was at that point that uh, Senator Wyden and Moran began a exchange of letters <laughs> with uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, plus a, um, a letter to uh, the President. And let me just make sure that I get these right. Um, so in October of 2021, Senators uh, Wyden and Moran sent a letter to uh, the DNI addressing two important issues. One was uh, what I was just talking about, which is the need to invest in modernization technology. Uh, and then the other one was promoting changes to Executive Order 13526, which has not been modified since 2009. And so uh, there's a, a lot of uh, argument that, in fact, that might be a little obsolete uh, as well. There have been enough changes and enough um, identified needs for, for uh, fixes um, that it, it, the executive order um, needs to be changed. By the way, the, that letter, the October 2021 letter, 
also um, asked the DNI uh, about whether or not there were lessons learned from the period at the height of the pandemic when a lot of people were working from home in the intelligence community and certain information got declassified in order to allow people to work from home. And so the question was, were there lessons learned? Did it turn out to be easier to declassify things than you thought? Was it possible to actually accommodate people working from home? And can that let those lessons be learned to apply to broader um, declassification? Um, the following January, since so January 2022, uh, the DNI wrote back, and these are all sort of public letters, because if you're going to talk about transparency, it's nice to talk about it transparently. Um, and she acknowledged uh, the severity of the problem. Um, and she also acknowledged that the current prioritization and resources directed at the problem were um, thus far insufficient and offered to work with Senators Wyden and Moran and by extension, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, to try to address this. So we established a partnership um, with, with the DNI, um, which uh, continues. Um, I mentioned Executive Order 13526. Um, this is an issue that is being taken up by the National Security Council. Um, and in May of 2022, uh, Senators Wyden and Moran um, wrote to President Biden uh, about this. And the point of that letter was to uh, ask the president to make this an urgent priority and to resource the National Security Council adequately so that it could fully tackle this issue. It is an extraordinarily complex interagency problem. If you want to deal with declassification reform across the government, the National Security Council is always very busy. Uh, it's got a crisis every day. And so it's easy for long-term reform efforts to not get the attention that they need. And then, of course, when you're dealing with many agencies that have many different kinds of equities when it comes to classification and declassification, uh, it's easy to lose track of them. And next thing you know, you have a herding cats problem and things don't get done. So um, the point of that letter was to really say this needs high level attention and that the White House and the National Security Council really need to make sure that everybody is on board, everybody is participating, everybody is offering substantive input so that the job can get done and so that um, it doesn't uh, languish. Um, the other point that the letter made was to say that um, uh, Congress and then members of the public should be uh, engaged uh, in that process as well. And uh, this past August, the DNI responded to that letter. And among the things that she said was, yes, indeed, uh, Congress um, uh, and civil society ought to be involved in that process. One other thing that was in that last letter was that um, the DNI attached uh, a few examples of where um, uh, different agencies are doing declassification and how, um, which was a step forward. Um, the, there were a number of redactions. There were a lot of redactions. Not surprisingly, these are sort of the activities that are going on within the intelligence community. But those, in fact, you know, drew more attention to the fact that some of this stuff is going to have to happen in closed session. Some of it is going to have to happen within the intelligence community. Um, certainly any resourcing that's it's it's going to be classified so there has to be a dual effort here both on the open transparent side and uh, behind closed doors um, and then speaking of uh, the committee um, following its September 2020 hearing um, the committee uh, has been uh, engaged on this issue and very interested. A lot of it you don't know about, um, but in the last Intelligence Authorization Act, there was language in the public report um, that uh, um, acknowledged the committee's ongoing concern for uh, this problem of an obsolete declassification system, not being able to keep up with the classification. Uh, it also directed the DNI and the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security to review and report on declassification practices and policies across the government, funding for these activities and investments in modernization. And then the committee directed uh, um, the DNI and the Undersecretary of Defense uh, to report on proposals to promote best practices that could be applied across agencies 
uh, and or as part of a federated system, uh, costs of these systems, and a spend plan for research and development and promotion of modernization technology. So we're looking forward to that report um, and looking forward to being able to continue to work with the government. Um, by the way, the um, most uh, recent um, Intelligence Authorization Act also had a provision uh, asking um, the PIDB to report on uh, possible amendments to Executive Order 13526, something they were already working on, but we thought it'd be a good idea to legislate that, um, to ask about uh, um, how the ISU can be made more effective, and also an update on the PIDB's recommendation related to the designation of the DNI as the executive agent for declassification. Um, I want to close before I take questions um, on a um, slightly uh, different topic, which is that I was asked about congressional um, requests for declassification of specific topics and uh, Senator Murphy's um, requests uh, were um, were mentioned before. Um, I can't speak at all for anybody outside the Intelligence Committee um, or for the House of Representatives, um, but having been at the Senate Intelligence Committee, I can tell you it takes many, many different forms. Um, we have the advantage of having direct access to the intelligence community, so it's easier to talk these things through with them. And sometimes these kinds of requests can come through in informal conversations. Um, oftentimes, though, um, they get sent through letters. The letters can be classified. Here's a specific piece of classified information that we'd like declassified. Um, sometimes they can be unclassified letters, or they can be articulated in other public ways. Unclassified letters, public hearings floor statements, press statements. It's always tricky when you're asking for something to be declassified in an unclassified setting. Um, sometimes you can say it directly. Sometimes you have to make an inference or imply it. Uh, it gets even trickier when you're um, passing unclassified legislation, um, to asking for the declassification of a piece of classified information. Um, but it is a learning process. Um, I have seen all of these uh, tactics used individually and in combination. Um, I've seen them work and I've seen them not work. Um, and so, you know, I want to sort of leave this, this part of the conversation with, it is a case-by-case -case issue. It requires a lot of attention. It requires a lot of persistence. Sometimes it requires a lot of arguing. Um, but there actually isn't a one size fits all. It depends on who's asking. It depends on who the administration is. It depends on the equities of the intelligence agency that are involved. It depends on the political context. Um, you know, I'll, one specific example, the committee passed legislation requiring the declassification of a report on who is responsible for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. The legislation passed. Uh, the report didn't get passed. Then there was an election. And again, at a confirmation process, the DNI was asked, you know, about this legislation that required this public report. She said, I'm going to adhere to this law. And she did. And the report um, was passed. So that's an example of it working. But it's also an example of uh, delays and the requirement of persistence uh, and sometimes the right people in the right place uh, making the declassification happen. And with that, I will um, pause. Thank you. Uh, well, so I think we have some options here. I think we uh, one of the thoughts was that maybe we could have a little bit of a discussion on some of the big topics um, that we are seeing coming up, and then uh, and maybe we can uh, integrate uh, some of Evan's comments because I think there's some really inter interesting and important ones. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start, but but I think it should be we can make it interactive with the board um, and uh, and kind of go from there. Oops, <laughs> apparently now I am mic'd. Um, uh, so I actually, I, I, I have a feeling, um, you know, uh, Evan actually uh, threw around a bunch of terms that are very familiar to us here on the board, but are probably less familiar to those in the audience. Um, so just to sort of put some of the things out there, um, Evan was talking about executive order um, 13526. Um, that, is the, that is basically the, the presidential direction that says, 
how something is classified and how it's not um, or how it gets declassified so it's it's the process for doing that it's the standards of classification uh it includes lots of other things too um, but that's what's being considered for reform right now um so when we think about our recommendations um one of the things that one of the reasons we want to have a hearing um and we want to actually talk about these things in public is because we really are thinking about why are things classified? Um, what is the basis for? Uh, what are the challenges that I mean, some of the challenges that Evan described? And then what can we do about it systematically? So I guess um, I'm going to start with that question a little bit. I'm going to go towards Executive Order um, 13526. Um, and I'm actually I'm going to turn the question back over to Evan um, and just ask if there are sort of big suggestions that you as a um, as a staffer on the and the Intel Committee um, think would be helpful um, as we as we think about recommendations going forward. So I think certainly it starts with the question of modernization and uh, the application of new technologies to the declassification process um, the need to do so in an integrated fashion federated across the federal government um, any way in which the executive order can be amended to promote that to accommodate those kinds of reforms certainly would uh, be valuable and certainly consistent with the kinds of things that the senators and the committee um, have been um, promoting um, there are um a number of other uh recommendations oh certainly um one of the long-standing problems is that uh information that is supposed to be declassified after 25 years or 50 years and this is all pursuant to the same executive order doesn't get declassified they just sit in databases and it doesn't happen and so there may be changes to the executive order to tweak the way in which the government deals with those historical documents. Um, it's long been a concern, and I don't know how to deal with this in the executive order, that there's a sort of cultural shift that's needed, right? That you need, um, and this is not ever to blame anybody, but that when the government is, leans towards classification rather than declassification, uh, you end up with overclassification, and there may be ways to fix that. And then one other thing that I will suggest, which is not Executive Order 13526 per se, um, but is also something that um, is, is, is being looked at, is the problem of uh, unclassified but still sensitive sources of information with names like law enforcement sensitive or for official use only. Um, this really bedevils members of Congress because they extract information from the executive branch. It's unclassified. Uh, the member of Congress may want to say something publicly about whatever they've uncovered. And there's a for official use only or some other designation at the top of, of the page. And it, uh, it becomes very hard for members of Congress then to engage the public in this issue the for official use only and these other designations um, are the subject of a separate executive order um, but it's there isn't the long history of figuring out what the justifications are or lack of justifications for these designations are or what the process for defouing or deleasing uh documents so um that is another issue that um is related to this that um, could use some consideration. I know the ISU looks very carefully at this issue as well. I'm going to keep asking questions, but um, do you want to? Sure. Absolutely. And then what do you think is the biggest challenge um, to work on the classification and declassification system? And what opportunities do you see for reform? So I, I do, it's two, two topics, right? The one is um, the modernization uh, uh, practice. Um, it is a, it's, it's not controversial that the system is obsolete. It's not controversial that it needs reform, um, but the issue involves investments. So there's front end money um that has to be uh um, invested um but that is a big part of it and this is the kind of thing that doesn't require anybody to wrestle with questions of what should or should not be classified in the front end so in that sense you 
can tackle this aspect of the reform without having to get in any fights about so substantive classification um, decisions. So hopefully, if you can get past the resourcing issue and questions about who's making these investments and who's promoting them, that should be low hanging fruit. Um, and the other is the uh, amendments to the executive order, which the National Security Council uh, is tackling. Um, that is challenging. Like I said, it's a big interagency process. Um, so, and as I mentioned as well, it's something that uh, uh, the committee and Senator Wyden, and Senator Moran are tracking very closely. What about the committee's um, interest in AI and using that uh, as a tool? Is that something that the committee is considering or supports? Um, it is part of the menu of uh, opportunities that are there for the declassification process. Um, when you have that much data, when you have massive databases, when you have to find the the records in those databases that are scheduled for declass for declassification but have not been yet certainly uh, AI and machine learning are part of that. I don't know whether or not Congress needs to legislate specifically on the exact um, uh, means to do this, um, but it's come up in in our hearing, uh, and it's certainly uh, part of the solution. Um, to, the, to the broader um, modernization problem. Yeah, uh, I think you know, uh, uh, Evan, you you did a good job and of uh, talking about the 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 um, lack of resourcing. Um, you know, would Congress potentially uh, consider something where you know an expansion of the IC would have to be matched by, in some ratio, uh, with you know, an increase in money spent on um, uh, improving the declassification system. So in essence, you would tie an expansion of the IC to a tie, uh, you would tie it to an expansion of, of, of resources going to the declassification and classification management system. I had not previously thought of that, uh, sort of an, an indexed uh, uh, resourcing of declassification efforts. Um, I'll have to give that one some thought. <laughs> The other issue about funding, um, you know, uh, uh, because you're here, you know, the the the, the PIDB itself is really not funded, um, and and um, so we're we uh, operate with the grace of the the archives. Um, you know, there was an effort last Congress to specifically uh, allocate funds to the PIDB. And, um, you know, uh, as we all know, the funding process in Congress can be uh, challenging. But, um, but has uh, you mentioned that, 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 you know, oftentimes there are these mandates to the PIDB. How about any effort to identify expressly funding for the PIDB to perform its mission? And, and I know that the, um, it, it goes both ways too, right? Because the ISU has also said that it exhausts its resources supporting the PIDB uh, and that it could use a separate stream. Um, that is certainly something uh, worth considering. Um, it uh, cuts across jurisdictions of committees. So it's not uh, purely the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, so we will have to talk to a number of stakeholders in Congress to make that happen. Speaking of talking to, um, you know, Senator Wyden and Senator Moran, who are on the, I think Senator Moran is on the Appropriations yes. Committee, but Senator Wyden is on the, you know, part of the challenge in this world is like the authorizers and the policy guys. Um, but um, you guys, Senator Wyden and Senator Moran had a bill um, to do a lot of things last Congress, or do you expect that the senators are going to reintroduce it? And what do you think is a path for legislation to solve this problem? So the, the legislation, as I mentioned, was the one to implement the PIDB's recommendation to designate the DNI as the executive agent for uh, declassification. Um, we don't know whether or not we'll uh, reintroduce that. Um, part of it is that um, the senators are looking to the DNI to take a leadership role on this, regardless of whether or not she's formally designated uh, the executive agent. Um, they do feel like they have a strong partnership 
um, with, uh, with the DNI. So, you know, hopefully some of this can come about regardless of the actual codification of that recommendation, but it's still on the table. And um, as I mentioned, the most recent Intelligence Authorization Act uh, asked the PIDB for an update on that particular recommendation. So, you know, it's still under consideration. I've got one more. Um, so, um, obviously, the uh, intelligence community isn't the only place where classified information is produced. Enormous amount of classified information is produced at DOD. It's considered operational information. Uh, the Department of Energy produces a lot of classified information that's not um, from the intelligence community. Um, what What is your sense of the other uh, committees that do have jurisdiction over DOE and DOD uh, outside of the IC? What is their appetite for, for reforming the system? It's a shared system. Uh, they're kind of all in it together, and many of the problems are the same. What's the, what's the work like with them? So that's a good question. Um, I will say that we could uh, use more interactions with between the committees. Um, Congress gets siloed sometimes. And if there was ever a subject that um, required working across not just um, federal government agencies, but committees of different jurisdiction in Congress, this is it. I know there is interest. I, I recall at a hearing recently, uh, Senator Warren at the Armed Services Committee was, was very interested in this topic. So I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that the interest in declassification reform is not limited to the uh, Intelligence Committee. I actually want to um, change a little bit the, the topic, because I think one of the things that we've talked a lot about is this idea that we have this amazing proliferation of records. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about what has happened in recent years, as we've, as we've sort of gone to elect electronic records, the number of records that are out there has just exploded um, because we we make more records um, from a practical standpoint. Um, and so we've been thinking a lot, of course, about how to deal with it systematically. But I think one of the things that we've heard from Congress as 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 Ezra um, as Ezra's description of our work over the past year uh, suggests was that we've gotten sort of discrete projects. Um, about uh, things that are of particular interest to Congress. Um, so uh, things on the Marshall Islands, uh, on the on nuclear testing in the in the Marshall Islands, um, uh, some other some specific topics, um, for example. What do you think the mechanism should be for prioritization of classification review um, in those worlds? Is there a role for Congress to play in particular? Um, is there a role for the public to play? Uh, is there a role for specifically um, historians to play? How do you think about that sort of question of prioritization, recognizing that we're probably not going to be in a place where everything immediately gets declassified as much as we might want that, you know, to be, to, to be a, a bit more systematic? So at the, at the risk of not answering the question, all of the above, um, <laughs> Congress plays a role, the public plays a role, historians uh, play a role. Uh, and at the end of the day, any entity that is offering recommendations, whether or not it's you or whether or not it's, it's, it's um, uh, the archives or the, through the mandatory um, declassification process is going to have to make um, some subjective judgments. Um, uh, my experience as, on the Senate Intelligence Committee is that we get to go directly to the intelligence community. So um, that exchange can happen um, directly and easily and quickly. Sometimes they're responsive, sometimes they're not, but it's there. Um, but other members of Congress and certainly the public um, don't necessarily have that. And so they do rely on a, a review and a decision to prioritize whoever, you know, whatever um, uh, they may, may suggest. So it's, it's, it's really important, but at the end of the day, some judgment calls can be made because a lot of people have a lot of interests in a lot of different declassified uh, classified topics. I wonder what Senator Wyden, how he would, if, how he would respond to the question of whose information is it? You know, like, um, it, it seems like there's a fundamental challenge here. As in, is classified information belong to the executive branch or to? Who's, who's, who does it belong to? Um, so I would say it belongs to the American public, but that doesn't necessarily mean they get to have it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something I might tell my children and they wouldn't understand. Um, so if it belongs to the American public, how can the American public get it? Um, 
so through the declassification process, um, whether or not it's that which is laid out in Executive Order 13526, after 25 years, after 50 years, history, uh, historical documents through FOIA uh, is an incredibly important um, uh, piece of legislation that uh, has done incredible service to the public over time um, through their members of Congress. Returning back to 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 where I come from, um, it, the public uh, has a right to be represented by their uh, members of, of Congress and their senators. Uh, and if they have a particular interest in a topic, uh, they have a right to ask their members to sort of seek its declassification. Um, as for who it belongs to, that sounds a little bit like a long-standing constitutional question as to um, uh, whether or not. Uh, the executive branch and the president per se has ultimate authority over that, but I'm going to leave that to Ben. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll get a question back from me uh, since you brought me into the conversation. I just wondered if you could, given your long service uh, to the committee, to the Congress, to the country, I wonder if you could reflect of where you think we are right now. This is one of those topics that is talked about a great deal. Um, but is progress made, and sometimes you can become a bit despairing as we talk about the explosion of electronic uh, records. Alyssa mentioned the fact that, you know, with just the click of a button, how easy it is to classify. Uh, do you feel like we have any momentum now on this subject and topic, and is there a way to sustain that momentum? Um, do you feel like progress is being made and attention being paid to it? It is impressive that the director of national intelligence has come to discuss the topic when there's a lot on any director's plate, but her plate in particular, whether, you know, Ukraine or, or other subjects. So um, I think we, I'll speak for myself, there's a certain amount of momentum right now on a topic that is not necessarily ever going to be uh, glamorous and front page. So I just wondered, you have this benefit of a, a great deal of experience with the committee that not a lot of people have. So I just wondered, your reflections on on where we are over time. I'm sure you've been discussing this for more than two decades, just where you feel like today and are we in a place of progress or a place of, um, it's just a, one of those problems that's always in the too hard bucket. So I think there are sort of two separate issues there. One is this question of overall reform. And I think there is absolutely progress insofar as there's a lot more attention being paid to that. And I credit the PIDB and ISU and others for having sort of done the work to uncover this issue. And I think that the fact that the DNI is speaking here is testament to this uh, interest. I think the fact that, you know, not just a couple of senators, but the Senate Intelligence Committee as a whole is weighing on this is, is progress. At the end of the day, though, um, the numbers, I guess, and will speak for themselves. The declassifications will speak for themselves. Either the logjam gets resolved or it doesn't, right? And so we're going to have to see what works and what doesn't. Are things coming out after 25 years or 50 years as they should, right? Or are they still stuck? Does the system continue to choke on itself? And this is a, a process that we're going to have to monitor all very, very carefully. Great. Um, thank you so much, Evan. I uh, really appreciate having you up here. And if you want to stay, you are more than welcome. We're, I think we're going to, we are, I'm going to do a little bit of a preview of where we're going on for the board in 2023. And then we are going to open it up to audience questions. Um, so get your questions ready. Um, we'll see how that goes. You, yeah, you're, you're fine. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about where we're going in 2023. Um, I do want to start with saying, um, so Ezra, um, just uh, we just changed leadership. Um, there is no way I can keep up with the number of things that Ezra uh, had the board do over the time. It's an amazing amount of leadership. And I'm so grateful um, for the way he uh, he ran the board um, in an incredibly um, nonpartisan way and an incredibly active way. Uh, we, did, we did a ton over the course of the past year. So um, I am uh, grateful grateful that he's still on it and I am looking forward to him continuing to direct um, to, to direct the energy um, for all of the things that we can do as a board. Um, so just want to start with that. And I also agree. Thank you, Carter, for organizing this conference. I think it's uh, or helping organize the conference. Um, really, uh, really a, a, a sort of big thing for us as a as a board too. Um, so as we 
Yes, we really need to. There are poor PIDB staff. Oh, and our, oh yes, who, definitely. Um, were because of our absence of funds are all back in Washington right now. So they labored tirelessly along with Ezra um, and the Clement Center too for putting but the staff is there watching um, uh, back in DC having helped to prepare all of this and um, and um, without our you know dear budget from Congress um, you know they had to stay um, stay back so they we owe them a, a thanks as well yes, so. we owe them a huge huge um, a thank you so um, but I do want to sort of go into the what we want what we plan to do in 2023 um, so I think we've previewed a lot of what we're talking about um, already uh, so one of the things that we we want to make sure as a board that we talk about are why all of these things matter um, I think you've heard some of that today already um, but we really want to make sure that people understand that these have uh, that there's a historical implication that there is a sort of real-time world of, of trust in government um, that uh, that declassification um, and classification policy um, plays into and those are important things for our democracy um, and we 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 so we want to make sure we have sort of processes that reflect that and that we have an, an a channel for um for conversation about it um that from a board perspective, um, one of the things we're therefore going to be focusing on a lot is the process piece. Uh, so um, as, as we talked a lot about, um, we're going to be working on recommendations for the new executive order. Um, we want to get um, public input um, on, on recommendations for the new executive order. Um, we're really trying to think about um, what we can recommend um, and really thinking about some of the questions that we've talked about today. So the, um, again, is there a way to sort of systematically handle explosion of, of, uh, of electronic records? Um, how do we think about questions of prioritization? Uh, how do we think about um, systems of classification in general? How do they all fit together? Um, how do we think about how um, the, the, are there any recommendations we can make about how the, um, the, uh, uh, the agencies work, how agencies work together for the federal government? So we're going to be spending a fair amount of time on that. Um, we also have some outstanding uh, things that we are continuing to work on. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Ezra mentioned that there's been a lot of progress on the JFK records. Um, that's certainly something that we're going to continue to follow um, because, again, even after all this time, um, the JFK ass assassination records are not all declassified. Um, so we want to make sure um, people understand the standards. If, if there are records that are appropriately uh, still classified, then people understand why, what, what does that look like? Um, not, again, on, on the specifics necessarily, um, but at least being able to talk about that. Um, you know, we um, as a board often talk about the fact that um, that the reality of classified records sometimes just withholding a single record makes people distrust things because they know there's a record out there. And so making sure there's some visibility into what that looks like, making sure that there's a public understanding uh, potentially of, of why records get withheld um, and, and sort of pushing um, to the extent that we can um, on those ideas of public interest. Um, I think what we also uh, have a report to Congress that is coming up again, um, where we want to talk about some of those things. Um, as, as, uh, as Evan mentioned, um, we continue to get taskings from Congress um, from, uh, uh, on specific things that we can, uh, we can provide um, support for. Uh, so we, we want to be responsive to those. Um, we also want to think about whether um, what, we, what we found actually on the individual classification requests um, that we, we have gotten over the course of the past year is that sometimes the board isn't the best entity um, to think about declassification process um, but there can be an absence of who is the best entity so evan talked about a lot of the different channels um, that congress goes through to potentially get things declassified um, they tend to be informal channels uh, they tend to be things like uh you know if someone's going through confirmation they get commitments um they they tend they tend to be letters back and forth um, and those can be incredibly effective but it also sort of raises those questions of prioritization that i mentioned before should there be a more systematic process um, for Congress to be able to ask for declassification records? What does that look like? Um, and so we're going to be exploring those two. Um, and uh, as as always happens over the course of the year, um, we we there are always record sets um, that become incredibly important. Um, we have we believe we have an important role to play in sort of uh, talking about those publicly and encouraging uh, more transparency um, with respect to what's happening. So that's kind of what we some of the things that we have on tap for um, for 2023. Uh, we're very much looking forward to it. Um, and of course, this conference, um, which we're also we're, we're planning on picking um, all the brains that we can uh, to, to think about how we move forward over the course of the next year. So I don't know if anyone has questions. Um, we're happy to take questions now um, if, if anyone wants to come up. If you have a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, please come to the, mic come to the microphone here. Just please uh, to line up. 
Um, and for anyone who's uh, again, and for anyone who is um, participating virtually, um, there's also a way to submit a virtual question. Again, that is um, PIDB at NARA dot, uh, dot gov. And this is the first time we're doing this in three years. Yeah, so uh, we're a little rusty at answering questions. Be, be sympathetic. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Matthew Monroe. Um, I appreciate the steps towards transparency measures that the DOD and DNI Haynes have been moving towards. It has been noted by a former agent of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations that the UFO incident involving Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Colby Landrum is still classified. As a child, I was within 10 miles of this incident that occurred in my community near New Kinney, Texas in December of 1980. This was an actual event with physiological effects that have been noted as possible exposure, ex possible exposure to radiation. The incident still has an unsolved component. If this, event, if this event involved a nuclear propulsion malfunction of a test aircraft, what steps are necessary to declassify information either from the Department of Energy or other departments of the government to clear the air on this historic case? Well, I can just say that uh, we're, thank you for thank you for your question. Um, we're not from I'm not familiar with that. I don't we you know it's the first we've heard of that. Um, you know you can send an email. We, you know I didn't catch catch the name and everything. Um, but look, I think uh, you know there's been a lot recently said and it's been covered in the in the media uh, about the the efforts of the current administration and the past administration to get to the bottom. A lot of a lot of these you know reported UAP incidents. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's a very challenging topic uh, because there's a massive amount of records that could relate to different potential events all across the government. Uh, but I'd appreciate if you just send in your that that name. Thank you. I think the question also points to we've talked about some of the mandatory declassification rules that are out there. And frankly, the backlog at a number of those departments that you specified, uh, whether it's 25 or 50 year uh, mandatory declassification reviews, you know, those queues and those backlogs are longer than they should be. So you know, those records, uh, to the extent there are records relating to something, should be subject to mandatory declassification reviews for those kinds of time frames. There's other things in terms of MDR requests that can be made from the public to the departments. And uh, uh, of course, FOIA being a very powerful tool, particularly for, for older records. So it, it does bring up the larger subject uh, and the importance of transparency and why it's important to clear those backlogs and adhere to the rules on mandatory declassification review. Uh, so if there are issues out there that can clear the air and we don't have um, misunderstandings or it creates a level of distrust that is unnecessary, it's one of the reasons, and Alyssa talked about, hopefully we're gonna be bringing why uh, declassification is so important as part of our work in 2023. So thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, my name is Matthew Connolly, um, and uh, I've been you know, following the work of the PIDB and, and ISU for many years now. And I just wanna commend all of you on the activism that you've shown in the last couple of years. And, and I, I really also, just speaking for myself, I, I like how it is that you're using your mandate to address issues that really are of very great public interest. I, I'd like to see even more studies like the ones that you've done on issues that many American citizens would like to know more about with the, you know, the access that you have um, according to your legal mandate. Um, you know, at least in theory, you could tell us all a lot more, you know, about things that many people would like to hear about. Um, but on the other hand, I'm really, to be honest, kind of disappointed that we uh, don't have more urgency from Congress. Um, about these problems. Um, just to take an example, 10 years ago, the Obama administration you know, directed the Office of Director of National Intelligence um, to develop new technology to accelerate declassification. And all of us, including you know, your predecessors in the PIDB, all of you expected that IARPA you know, was going to take up this challenge. And, and they did nothing. They just completely ignored it. Um, so I'd like to think things might be different now um, with Director Haynes. Um, I wonder, though, you know, if she really does think that it's under-resourced, DARPA has a multi-billion dollar budget. 
I mean, IARPA, we don't know how big these budgets are. Certainly, if they wanted it to be a priority, they could make it a priority. They could resource this adequately because everyone agrees that we have to develop technology to accelerate declassification. And if they won't, why can't Congress? Why can't Congress start earmarking funds to develop technology to accelerate declassification? I was a little surprised that when um, Ezra Cohen asked, you know, why couldn't there be a formula if you're going to keep increasing, you know, the budget of 18 different intelligence agencies every single year, why couldn't you develop a formula? One I like is the idea that if, for example, the Pentagon is spending some $600 million a year on public relations and advertising, why couldn't they spend the equivalent amount on reviewing classified information and releasing it to the public? So there is tremendous public interest. If there aren't more people here, it's just because people don't even know the PIDB exists. And how is it that, you know, with 1.3 million people having top secret security clearances, you know, a Pentagon with an $800 billion budget, you can't earmark funds for the Information Security Oversight Office. I think it has a staff of about a dozen people, and they're meant to be the, the watchdog that's meant to oversee all this. Why can't you appropriate some money for something that every single American would like to understand better. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that. And I, I, I won't make it, I won't put Evan on the spot on that one. I, I think, um, you know, we certainly agree about the importance of it. And I think one of the things that we think of as a board is really putting some pressure on exactly that area. We really, um, I think some of it is attention, right? So I think one of the things actually that, that, um, that, uh, uh, Senators uh, Moran and Wyden have done really well is actually take it up from a congressional standpoint. But Congress is a comp complicated entity. Um, it's got lots of different players, um, and it's it, it doesn't always it doesn't always get um, maybe where it should. And again, sort of it ends up as a challenging set of priorities. Um, I will say, I think um, just on the on the question of records overall, I think we all think that there's um, one one of the reasons we're so excited about having a technology panel uh, tomorrow is because we think there's incredible potential um, for long term uh, technology changes that could actually help some of these things. That doesn't mean that there's AI is solving our, our our problems necessarily, but the idea that things could be faster or prioritized more, or found it found in a better way, or uh, we could reduce dis, uh, discrepancies between classification decisions, any of those things is a positive. Um, and so I think long term, um, we do think you know going back to I think Ben's question, we are seeing some momentum now, um, and I uh, I like to think that we're seeing some momentum. Um, so hopefully um, hopefully you will too. And I'm seeing them growing. And your question points out, and I think we have to continue to talk about these issues. Uh, and that's how change will happen. The ISU mandate um, uh, to get a little bit into the weeds, but as you pointed out, they have a massive mandate and uh, very little staff and very little resources for when you read their mandate is a is a government spanning mandate for supervising uh, the classification system and a variety of tasks. And, and as you pointed out, the, the resources don't match the authorities in the, in the mandate. And um, you know, we continue to talk about these things and um, you know, we've got some leadership there on the Congress. Having an open hearing by the Senate Intelligence Committee is not a minor thing. Uh, we have some people with some additional background here besides that, and that is a big, that is a big deal. And, and you know, hopefully, you know, we won't lose that that momentum, but that is continuing to bring the attention to it as the way change will happen. I'd like to just say two things uh, in response to that, to your to your comment. Um, first of all, there are enormous inefficiencies in the system. Um, a lot of this could be improved by fixing those inefficiencies. For instance, why does one agency have 25 different guides on how to classify, inf classify information and they don't agree with each other? Why do different agencies think that the same piece of information is classified at different levels? Why isn't there a IC wide classification guide, right? Those are just a few things I just threw out right now that could really cut down the timeline on a lot of the things, you know, a lot of the delays. So I, I think we do have to act. We have to, if we don't act quickly on fixing these inefficiencies, we are going to be in really bad shape because the volume of records, especially digital records, is, is increasing uh, at an exponential rate. Uh, and then the second thing, um, you know, re regarding ISU, I mean, the board has talked about, and I think it's something to consider in the executive order, should ISU even be at the National Archives? Um, you know, the National Archives has a, a, a historical look back mandate. 
Um, the ISU is really supposed to be looking forward, making sure that rules are being followed moving forward. And, and so I think there's a real question to be had. Does it belong where it is right now? I'll just I'll jump in quickly and just thank Evan for being here to hear some of this stuff. I mean, his uh, Senator Wyden is one of the great uh, proponents of transparency and open government. So he's uh, you're you're preaching to his choir or something. And, and uh, thank you for coming and and listening to that side of uh, our our harping and, and questions. Oh yeah, like, um, uh, yeah, like um, uh, but thanks again for coming. Yeah, my, can't hear you virtually. yeah, sorry about that. So the Information Security Oversight Office, according to you know Robert Gates, Richard Newstat, you know, wanted to put it, you know, either in the Office of Management and Budget, um, or they wanted to put it in the Office of White House Counsel, and failing that in the National Security Council, because they knew that it, unless it was in a part of the executive branch that had real authority, it would be ignored. And so what did they do? They put it in general services administration. <laughs> and then later, you know, as you know, when the National Archives hived off, it took ISU with it. But I absolutely agree with you. That was the original idea of ISU was that it was going to be in a part of the executive branch with that, that would have real authority over the rest of the executive branch. And so, yes, it would be fantastic if we could revisit that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie. I'm an undergrad at UT, so how come? Um, <laughs> So uh, in the event that the reforms that you guys at the PIDB have been asking for for years end up do getting passed, uh, and if that ends up happening because of the political outcry, because of the Biden stuff and the Trump stuff and the Pence stuff and whatever ends up coming out in the next couple of days, um, is, there, is there a possibility that uh, the PIDB's and NARA's mission as uh, a non-political entity and an, or an apolitical entity and a nonpartisan mission, um, is there a possibility that that gets threatened because of that? So I actually think a lot of the things that we're talking about really are good government efforts. And I think that you can always take things um, and politicize them one way or another. Um, that's always possible. I think one of the things that we've done very well as a board is keep an eye on things that are good government um, oriented. Um, so that doesn't mean there aren't there isn't a political maelstrom <laughs> uh, at times um although i think we might all be surprised we were a little you know i think ben sort of alluded to this um you know you don't really expect your, this to be on the front page um uh but, but i think the reality of um thinking about reforms um look if we can do something that is lasting and systemic um, if that is, that will be an improvement for government, it will be an improvement for transparency, um, and it will be a good thing for all of us. And I think that's really what we're all striving for. Yeah, and I would just like to add, thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, I don't think the PIDIVs uh, would be threatened by this. I think there's bipartisan support for what we're doing. They're just realizing in the administration and Congress that this is expensive and we have to make difficult choices and prioritize. But um, all of our recommendations to the president this year were unanimous. We never had a dissenting uh, uh, vote on the PIDIB. These are things that um, people on both sides can agree with. So I, we don't we don't feel threatened. We th we think we have support. It's just we're trying to publicize this as much as we can, and and can be good for national security. Like the um, the the default in the national security community has been to not share. And maybe we're seeing some ramifications of that now institutionally and 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 go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and it, it fuels conspiracy theories and the 911 uh, records weren't released for 18 years or 20 years. Uh, we just pushed and got them re released this year. Um, <clears throat> there was nothing conspiratorial about them. It's just, but it looked bad that it took so long and it was because they didn't have the resources to process the records. Uh, so um, we think this is good government because it will dispel some of these rumors. Following up on Carter's point um, as well, I think I think what we've actually seen from the national security world is that um, people recognize that being siloed is actually bad for national security. Um, you end up with overlap, you end up with duplic duplication, you end up with um, people who should know certain things that they do there they don't, and that's that's a potential long term problem. So I think um, hopefully um, you know one of the things I think Dan and I Haynes has actually uh, focused on is the idea that 
um, having a system of classification and declassification that is effective is good for national security. It's not, it's, it shouldn't endanger uh, national security. It's actually a positive. I'll just add one other thing on that. And when you look at what are the, what are the national security challenges that are facing this country? Um, a lot of them are gonna require us to work with, uh, with, with our allies and partners, um, uh, especially when we look towards the Pacific. And uh, so this really becomes about, you know, are we, uh, 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 hindering our ability to succeed um, around the world because we're we're guarding everything. We're guarding everything so much that we can't we can't share with our allies. We can't we can't bring them into uh, certain places where we're going to need their help. Um, and uh, so it, again, it's, it, this is not about um, you know just coming in and uh, just saying we're declassifying everything. It's about building a better system. And uh, and I and I think that. Uh, we're on a very, very good footing right now to, to start working on building a better system. Yeah, hi, uh, Mike Isikoff with Yahoo News. Obviously, this entire issue um, is getting a lot more attention these days because of the discovery of classified records at the uh, office and home of uh, Presidents Trump, Biden, and now Vice President Pence. Leaving aside all questions of whether there's any criminal culpability by anybody here, there's a, there, there are some real legitimate public policy issues that arise from this. And one that leaps out at me is one would assume that when a record gets classified, when a document gets classified or an email, there's a record kept of that. Um, yet we know in the case of Trump, the, the archives was aware he had records they, that, that should have been returned to them. But in the case of President Biden and Vice President Pence, there seems to these records seem to have been sitting there for years in some cases without anybody at the archives or the intelligence community being aware that they were missing. How is that possible? And is that something that the board um, would address as part of the project you're involved in? So I, I actually think, I'd be interested to hear if other folks have, have thoughts on it, but um, I actually think it's a reflection of the explosion that we were talking about before. Um, so if you think about how classified information works um, for, uh, you know, imagine you're dealing with something that is a classified fact, um, you're writing a new document, um, you end up having to put it in, um, you print it off, uh, you have, uh, there isn't a sort of marking for it because there's so many records um, for each document and in, in the way that you might think there are for very sensitive records um, but it doesn't quite work the way you might think for um for sort of the the long term the long tail of, of classified records and i think audit there's nobody keeps track of what records well, have been classified so, so I, i'm gonna actually turn it over to paul noel in, in, in two seconds but the thing i the thing i would say about it is that we I think that the system that we want to go to, the, the more forward looking thing, um, I actually think that we can do a better job protecting secrets um, if we are um, if we have a smaller number of things that are um, that are secrets. Right. Um, and we can do a better inventory. We can have a, a more sort of controls on it um, if we are more confident that that's the system. So I do think that what you know, going to the sort of root of your question about is this something that we would address? I think that as we think about what the system looks like, um, protecting the information that we have to protect has got to be part of that process. We're not, you know, we're, we're the public interest declassification board. I think we all recognize that classified information is a reality and should be a reality. There are things that shouldn't be out in public. Um, and so it's, but it's coming up with the right balance for those things and then making sure that we do a good job of protecting them. Uh, to answer your question, which is a very interesting one, um, when the Allies invaded Normandy, Operation Overlord, there were a print, there were printed copies with numbers on them, I believe, and there was a set of them, and everybody knew, and there were no photocopy machines, and so you did know where they all were, and for certain important documents, there still are, but in the main, that has moved in the last uh, several decades to a system where we do not have numbered copies of most classified documents and so i could print off five copies give them to um ad administrative officials um and would not necessarily um have a copy print copies for the cover page on them right? uh, they'd all have cover pages and be in pouches and uh, everything but we we wouldn't necessarily 
and and they could say we've destroyed the copies and we don't check on that. But so it, it, there aren't numbered copies anymore it, from most classified documents. So it would be hard to know where. Um, a large part of this has to do with you don't know if something's missing if you don't know what you have. So there's kind of an outbound problem as well, right? Uh, so I think that this is really where the board's been going, which is we need a digital system and. AI driven digital system that isn't just, you know, back end going back to try to free up the backlog. We need to be applying those methodologies on the front end. One, as Alyssa said, to reduce overclassification, but also uh, we need to do a better job of, no of knowing what we're creating, what records we're creating. Now, of course, there's no fail safe system. And uh, the White House is, is always dealing with a million issues. People are printing things out. But again, it's very hard to know what you're missing if you don't know what you have. And when you look like we did with the Marshall Island study, the cost of digitizing, you know, these physical records. So, you know, obviously before digital, everything was physical. Uh, there's still a lot that hasn't been digitized. Uh, for classified records, you're looking at, you know, 32 cents a page. If you're talking about billions of pages of records, and the archives, I think, only has a $500 million budget, um, I think you, there's, there's a problem. Uh, there's just a, a math problem. So we need to get an AI driven system in and on, on the front end. We're, we're going to be talking about that tomorrow so that we, we have a better idea of knowing what we have. Just one uh, follow up on this. You've all talked about the explosion in the number of classified documents. Can you quantify that? What, how many we're talking about? And can you break it down? Top secret, secret, confidential. So, so it is a that is a phenomenal question. <laughs> <laughs> that's classified. No joke, it's classified. So there's actually some interesting background on that um, because ISU has tried to quantify it um, in, in terms of overclassification and, and, and classify the um, quantify the cost as well. So thinking about what that actually looks like in practice and then thinking about um, it is a cost to the public. You have to store records. So the more records you have, um, the more storage space you have. It has to be certified to a certain level so that it can maintain classified information. There's a whole back end that has costs. So there is actually a benefit to us thinking about exactly those questions and thinking about it for numbers um, for that reason. So is there a number? Um, they, it is for the same reason that Ezra flagged. Um, they, 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 they started coming up with numbers um, and then they realized that they were not good numbers and they went back to the drawing board. And I don't think that we currently have. We have, we, set of numbers. there are, the Department of Defense, all of the IC agencies, the Department of Energy, everybody is producing classified records on different systems that don't talk to each other. Uh, you know, again, we need to do a better job of knowing what we have. And so we don't have an answer for you. Yeah. I wish we did. Uh, that agency's right to Congress. And one of them, I believe, talks about the number of classified records, but I'm not sure which report that is. In terms of petabytes, just to give you an idea. Okay. Hi, um, Dustin Voltz with the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm also speaking on a panel tomorrow, so I hope you all come by for that one. Um, I'd like to uh, stay uh, on the uh, uh, topic that my previous two question askers asked about uh, the um, Biden, Trump, and now Pence uh, document seizures. Uh, just, Evan, um, I'm curious, from your perspective in Congress, and I stepped in a bit late, so sorry if you did already address this, from a legislative standpoint, um, the things that uh, you mentioned, Senators Wyden and Moran and others are interested in, do you think that this does complicate efforts um, politically to uh, get, get something forward? Does it potentially make it you know, more interesting for, for lawmakers? I'm just curious if you think this will have any substantive impact on, on that, recognizing the issues are, are not necessarily directly linked. And then a second question for the board itself. There may be a a time soon when the public is, I think, already quite interested in knowing what are in the different stashes of classified documents that have been recovered from former President Trump, President Biden, and former Vice President Pence. Um, putting aside the criminal aspects, again, uh, which will have to play out their course, I, I'm curious if any of you think that the Public Interest Declassification Board could serve a role at some point 
assessing those documents and seeing what, if any of them, should be released to the public, uh, especially as at least two of those, actually all three of those uh, politicians that I mentioned may be running for president in the next presidential election. Um, that seems like that would be a very condensed timeline, but there does appear to be as some of you have mentioned before, no other real mechanism for there to be a review in the public interest of sets of classified documents. So in light of that, is that something any of you have considered? Has anyone in Congress or elsewhere asked you to think about uh, that, that possibility? Um, what else would you have to say about that? Thank you. Sure, I, I might go back first. on mine. Or do you want to go first? Or do you the, the, the answer is I don't know. Um, you know, this need to reform the, de the declassification system has been going on for a long time. It's very bipartisan. It's almost nonpartisan. Uh, it gets in the weeds in everything from technology to minor provisions of the executive order. Um, my hope is that what is going on now with these classified records, um, I don't know whether it'll have any impact, but I hope it doesn't get in the way of the momentum that we have here um or necessarily complicated because as Alyssa said this is basic good governance it's not political it's not part of a campaign it's not being talked about all the time on on cable news but it has to happen and it has to happen in a bipartisan way for anything meaningful to happen so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be linked to the, the headlines of the day I actually want to follow up on that point that's what and to answer this the second question um because I think it actually goes back to the question of um how do you stay out of the politics of it um and one of the things I think we've done very well as a board um is think about things that are long term um we've thought about systemic change we've thought about um we've thought about um categories of records that are uh, you know things like 9 11 that are big historical events and those decisions were intentional um we think it's really important for um for us to be in that world, um, recognizing that there are things that are going to have to come out or, or are likely to come out about the documents um, in one shape or another. Um, we don't actually think for the most part um, that that is the right role for the board um, because uh, again, the, the the idea is not for the board to be used for political purposes. Um, and so, yes, they are absolutely there's 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 information that is absolutely in the public in, interest. But there is a lot of information um, that is classified that is in the public interest to know. Um, we have to pick wisely um, to make sure that we are um, we are able to make recommendations long term that are good, good government oriented. Um, uh, Alex Howard, uh, also a proponent of open government for a long time. Um, thank you for hosting a public meeting in the public space. We haven't seen so many of these for years. Uh, thank you also for making it available to the members of the media and for committing to post it on YouTube afterwards. Um, that's all a great model for a public body, especially one that seeks to, I think, enhance the public conversation about these things. Uh, I think the uh, reviving of your blog has been great, and it's good to see you all on Twitter, although I hope that you uh, continue to engage carefully there. Um, one of the uh, great things that happened last year in the space is when we saw a president of the United States decide to declassify information that was of public import about what we knew about another nation state intending to invade another country and then make sure that that got out to the public um, so it was not just declassified but it was disclosed and then disseminated through the process of public engagement and it was a great example of how then we were able to have a public consensus about what was happening in the world and this is a challenge these days since we have to see some differences of opinion about what's actually happening the causes of our planet warming uh, whether there is a disease which is causing people to die uh, whether the different things are effective about treating it inoculating people against it and so on so establishing public facts is very important in our democracy and it seems to me that you all have an extraordinary trust with trying to get the outcome we had last year where you had declassification and disclosure but i come to this meeting and you described a reported declassification review we all know uh folks in politico well maybe we don't all know but politico reported there's a declassification review going on i have not looked and found a place where you all have talked about that where there was a press conference where the president talked about that where we've seen a white house reestablish its open government initiative at whitehouse.gov open have you all been approached by the administration to 
comment upon that review in a public way. Which review? I'm sorry, I don't know. So we know that there's an existence of a memorandum. The National Security Council is looking at this issue. You know, the okay. president's the, asking the, to do that. Update the the update of the executive order. Right. So why don't we have more ongoing narration of that review in a public face in a way in the same way that you're offering this public narration of your work? So that's a question there. And the second, um, I really appreciated um, the letter that you sent to the White House regarding transparency plans. And I'm curious why um, those plans weren't a commitment in our United States National Action Plan for Open Government, which came out in December. And if any of you are aware that such an action plan existed, or if we might see that as a commitment in the uh, United States domestic commitments in the Summit for Democracy, since this administration is talking about government transparency again, since we can see the connection between engaging and informing the public, um, if we might see some real investment in participatory democracy to improve public trust, which is all you know is very low, and the extent to which that's been created by information voids, which could have perhaps been closed, um, continues. And I mean, my colleagues in the media have pointed out not disclosing what's happening can create conspiracies. We're seeing that right now with respect to the White House's stance on this. Like there was an information void created by not speaking up, by saying things weren't discovered. And, um, are you going to be more public about offering your perspectives on these issues in a way that would help inform and shape the public conversation to bring it into the very meaty issues you're talking about to get to the outcomes you want? Because with all due respect, I don't think the Senate hearing is the deliverable. I think that passing legislation and implementing it is so that we get public trust back so that when we have the next national security issue, we don't have another million Americans die. So thank you very much for your work and I look forward to your conference tomorrow. Uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your comments. I, I, the one thing I will, I will say on that, uh, uh, oh. Um, the, the one thing I will say on that is I think um, you have we I think we all recognize that we all play different roles in government. Um, so from a practical standpoint, we are an external board. Um, we advise, we do as much as we can on transparency. Again, the goal for us um, in that exact executive order that you're talking about is to put out a public report with recommendations that are informed by the public. And that is that is really why one of the reasons that we brought that up today, because that's exactly where we want to go. Um, so the, the, the piece on, on transparency, we're just we're, we're just sort of starting that process. So from a from a practical standpoint, um, we we have uh, we're anticipating that we will be more public, but we're still the early days. So, um, but the goal again is to sort of take input, um, put things out, um, be more public, put things out on the blog as we get them, uh, do a public report, um, and 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 on, and we'll have we'll have recommendations to Congress as well that will also be public. So and and just to add something. Uh, we did notice that President Biden's statement declassifying uh, intelligence on Russian invasion plans was a remarkably successful declassification, and that this uh, was an example of the good that could come from declassification, and we're trying to work this into uh, a larger thing. But uh, we, we certainly noticed that and, and, and want to stress it. Um. So, so I think uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions right now. Um, and uh, one thing I will say is that um, on that on that same theme of transparency, um, if do, folks do have questions that they want to uh, want us to answer after the fact, um, please do um, email um, uh, PIDB at nara.gov. Um, we will answer them on our blog. Um, so again, <laughs> we are trying very hard to be public, um, even even when we don't tweet that much. Um, <laughs> So, um, but thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we really appreciate having you all here. Um, thank you again to the PIDB uh, staff who we are sad not to have here today um, and uh, for hosting us here uh, for the Clemens Center. And um, I, I just want to make sure everyone knows that the DNI fireside chat is at 6.30 p.m. in the auditorium. Uh, so please join us there as well. Thank you again. <laughs>